Polarity in diploid, uh, diptoroid eggs. For those of you who don't know, um, uh, diptoroids are insects with two wings instead of four, die to terror. Uh, 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 and that includes mosquitoes, it also includes flies. And uh, for example, it would not include dragonflies with four wings. <coughs> Um, there's a recent article by Yoon et al, and it's available on the internet for free. Uh, Embryo polarity in moth flies, moth flies are a kind of fly, and mosquitoes relies on distinct old genes with localized transcript isoforms. And it's a fascinating article. The abstract starts Unrelated genes establish head-to-tail polarity. That's a fancy word for saying the head starts at one end and the tail is at the other. Uh, we'll see what happens when that gets messed up. In embryos of different fly species, raising the question of how they evolve this function. And I would say raising the question of whether they evolve this function. We show that in moth flies, uh, Clogmia and uh, Lutzomyia, a maternal transcript isoform of odd paired, which is a g name of a gene, is localized in the anterior egg and adopted the role of anterior determinant without essential protein change. Additionally, Clogmia lost maternal germplasm, which contributes to embryo polarity in fruit flies. Fruit flies get a little bit of maternal embryo, uh, maternal material in the germplasm, and it makes the head be at one end, or it helps make the head. As we'll find out, there's another determinant as well. In Culicine, that is Culex and Aedes and Anopheline mosquitoes, there are two different kinds, two different major clades there. Uh, embryo polarity rests on a previously unnamed zinc finger gene instead of that other gene we were talking about, or pangolin, respectively. These genes also localize an alternative transcript isoform at the anterior egg pole. Basal branching crane flies, another kind of fly, also enrich maternal pangolin transcript at the anterior egg pole suggesting that pangolin functioned as the ancestral axis determinant in flies once upon a time. In conclusion, flies evolved an unexpected diversity of anterior determinants and alternative transcript isoforms with distinct expression can adopt fundamentally distinct developmental roles. Why unexpected? Because evolution is not supposed to work that way. The most fundamental genes are supposed to be the most conserved because if you mess with them, the embryo dies. Now, eLife has put its own digest on this. And again, since it makes a good summary, we'll go through it with very few exceptions. Animals have head and tail ends that develop when they are embryo, an embryo. The genes involved in specifying these ends vary between species, and even closely related animals may use different genes for the same roles. For example, the products of two unrelated genes called bicoid in fruit flies and panish in common midges accumulate at one end of their respective eggs to distinguish head from tail ends. So in midges it's panish in Fruit flies is bicoid, and we knew that coming in. It remained unclear how other fly species, which have neither a bicoid nor a panish gene, those are brand new genes. Well, almost brand new genes. Distinguish the head from the tail end, or how genes can evolve the specific function of bicoid and panish. Cells express genes by producing gene templates called messenger uh, ribonucleic acids. This should be old stuff for some of you at least. Uh, mRNAs for short. The central portions of messenger RNAs, known as protein coding sequences, are then used to produce the protein.
Proteins can play several distinct roles, which they acquire through evolution. Well, they must because otherwise it's designed, and we all know that it's not true. This can happen in different ways. For example, genetic mutations in the part of a gene that codes for protein may alter the resulting protein, giving it a new activity. Alternatively, Sequences at the beginning and end of an mRNA molecule that do not code for protein but regulate when and where proteins are made. So RNA has more than just protein coding ability. Can influence a protein's role by changing its environment. Many genes produce mRNAs with alternative sequences um, at the beginning or the end, a process known as alternative transcription. Here, Yoon et al. identified three unrelated genes that perform similar roles to bicoid and panish in the embryos of several different moth flies and mosquitoes. These genes appear to have acquired their activities because one of their alternative transcripts accumulated at the future head end, rather than through mutation in the protein coding sequences. Although one of them also has an alternative uh, transcription as well. <coughs> Studying multiple species also made it clear that Panish inherited its function from a localized alternative transcript of an old gene that duplicated and diverged. Uh, we'll discuss the evidence behind that hopefully a little bit. These findings suggest that alternative transcription may provide opportunities for genes to evolve new roles in fundamental processes in flies. Most animal genes use alternative stop and start and stop sites for transcription, but the reasons for this remain largely obscure. We have no idea what is really going on. This is especially the case in the human brain. As you may remember from a few weeks ago, there, was, there is a protein in the brain which is only partly transcribed and it makes the brain bigger and presumably better, smarter. The reason why we're not apes is partly because of that particular gene. The findings of Yoon et al. Therefore, raise the question of whether alternative transcription has played an important role in the evolution of the human brain. Well, we kind of knew that already, but... <clears throat> Introduction. The specification of the primary axis, that is, head on one end, tail on the other end, in embryos of flies, diptera, offers important advantages for studying how new essential gene functions evolve in early development. This process rests on lineage-specific maternal RNAs that are localized at the anterior egg pole, anterior determinants, which surprisingly have changed during the evolution of flies. That's not supposed to happen in standard evolution. With, while the anterior determinants of most flies remain unknown, they can be identified by comparing the transcriptomes of anterior and posterior egg halves. You cut the egg in two, you see which our messenger RNA is most populous in the head rather than the tail or vice versa. We're gonna see some of that. Furthermore, their function can be analyzed in the syncytial early embryos of a broad range of species via microinjection, considering timing and subcellular location. It is therefore possible to conduct phylogenetic comparisons at the functional level. Finally, when the function, we're gonna see some of that. Finally, when the function of anterior determinants is suppressed, embryos develop into an unambiguous, predictable phenotype. These embryos lack all anterior structures and develop as two outward facing tail ends, a double abdomen. Sort of like some politicians you know. Um, <clears throat> Anterior determinants can be encoded by new genes with a dedicated function in establishing embryonic polarity. One example is bicoid in the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. Fruit fly, of course, is famous in terms of uh, uh, studying uh, genetics and evolution. 
Maternal mRNA of bicoid is localized in the anterior pole of the egg and bicoid protein. Notice the italics are for the gene itself and the, and the mRNA and the, the capital is the protein itself is expressed in a gradient in the early embryo. Bicoid deficient embryos fail to develop anterior structures and instead form a second tail end or a symmetrical double abdomen when the maternal activity gradient of another gene, hunchback, is disrupted simultaneously. The bicoid gene originated in the lineage of uh, cyclorephine uh, flies more than 140 million years ago by duplication of Zirknilt, or Zen, sometimes known as Hox3. Um, that's because we have flies from 140 million years ago and we've sequenced them and of course that's how it works. Which in insects plays an important role in extra embryonic tissue development. Uh, the expression and function of uh, cyclorephine um, bicoid orthologs are conserved, but a bicoid has not been found outside this group and has been lost in some lineages within cyclorapha. So uh, bicoid is uh, unique to fruit flies and their kin. Another example is panish, which encodes the anterior determinant of a midge, Chernomus reparis. Um, this gene evolved by gene duplication of the TCF homolog pangolin, otherwise known as pan, and capture of the material promoter of a nucleoside kinase gene. As uh, pan has been fused to some other gene, and has been called panish for pan-like. Pangolin functions as the effector of, uh, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, boy, that sure looks like the double S in German, rather than, I'm sure it's supposed to be beta, but whatever. Beta catenin dependent WNT signaling pathway. Canonical WNT signaling but Panish lacks the beta catenin domain of pangolin and sequence similarity between pangolin and Panish is limited to the cysteine clamp domain. That is, there's 30 amino acids that are pretty close to each other um, and everything else is different. So apparently it's been basically, you take two different ones and you fuse them. Uh, it'd be interesting to know how closely it fits to the, um, to the other ones. Uh, is this a more or less brand new uh, uh, en enzyme and can you get there using strictly unguided evolution? Panish has not been found outside the family Chernomidae, suggesting that lower dipterans use different anterior determinants. Here we've used embryos of a wider range of dipteran species in other words, instead of just taking those two that lack bicoid and panish to address the question of how anterior determinants evolve. We started our analysis with moth flies, uh, psychodidae, uh, clogmia alba punctata, and we're going to see cal a lot from C A L, and then also Lutsomia longipalpus, which um, Again, they're going to have LLO as an abbreviation there. And subsequently extended it to mosquitoes. Uh, Culicidae, that is Culex uh, kinkafasiatus, uh, Aedes aegypti, and Anopheles gambia, and Anopheles colusi. And to crane flies, specifically Nephrotoma suturalis. Our results reveal three distinct old genes that evolved anterior determinants by localizing an alternative maternal transcript isoform. That's to say there's the embryo, the zygote as they call it, and the maternal form. And so there's an alternative maternal 
form, and it's not exactly the same, at the anterior egg pole of the respective species. Therefore, alternative transcription might have played an important role in the evolution of this gene function and gene regulatory networks in fly embryos. Sorry. Um, there's um, the standard evolutionary branch that you expect. You'll notice that crane flies come off early on. Um, and then you have Clogmia and Lutzmyla, which are moth flies. And then you have Chernomus, which is common midge, and Anopheles and Culex and Aedes. And they don't have anything from these, so that's work for somebody else to do. And then, of course, Drosophila, which has bicoid in it. Results. An alternative maternal transcript of the conserved segmentation gene odd paired, and that should be italicized, I missed that. Uh, the computer program will take out and drop all of the uh, italics, and if I don't put them all in, you don't show. They don't show. Uh, functions as anterior determined in clogmia, which I did get italicized. We annotated uh, 5,602 transcripts from the anterior and posterior transcriptomes of one hour old bisected clogmia embryos. So they take the eggs and divide them. And rank them according to the magnitude of their differential expression scores and p-values, and here's what it looks like. And you will notice that in the anterior, you have a probability of 10 to the minus 25 that p, pardon me, OPA, which is odd paired, uh, is in the anterior rather than in the posterior, and, and uh, you can see that as you get down, you find a lot of things that are equal. And uh, here's the p equals 0 0.001, which they're being careful of because they want, uh, they're doing multiple comparisons, so you expect some scattering beyond the p equals 0.05. A level, but you can see some of them are actually pretty heavily involved in the head, but the really big one is odd paired. In the anterior embryo, the most enriched transcript was homologous to odd paired. The Drosophila homolog of mammalian zinc, or zinc finger of the cerebellum, which is z zinc C for cerebellum genes. Zic proteins are known to function as transcription factors or cofactors. Odd paired was discovered in a screen for early dystrophila segmentation genes and subsequently classified as a pair rule gene since odd paired mutants fail to develop alternating segments. Apparently it's, uh, the embryo is divided into segments very much like the vertebrate embryo has segments that eventually turn into vertebrae. Um, but, um, but odd paired was needed for that segmentation. During the Drosophila segmentation process, odd paired is expressed in a single broad domain and controls the frequency doubling of other pair rule genes. So it's kind of a master gene if you want to consider it that. The clogmia genome contains a single odd paired locus, Cal, OPA, again, that's from Clogmia AL, and then odd paired. Using the RNA sequence data from pre-blastoderm and blastoderm embryos and rapid amplification of DNA N, so they're, they're um, finding where this is coming from in the gene, we identified maternal and zygotic. There's two different ones. Cal OPA transcripts with alternative first exons that we mapped onto a 54 kilobyte genetic uh, genomic scaffold. The maternal transcript, Cal OPA maternal, was detected in pre blastoderm embryos, 0 0.5 hours old, uh, haven't really divided much, and the syncytial blastoderm embryos, which are now four hours old. The zygotic transcript, which is made by the embryo itself, 
Calopa zyg was found in cellularized blastoderm embryos in seven years old, seven hours old, and gastrulating embryos, which are nine hours old. Protein alignments with homologs from other flies suggested Calopa zygote encodes the full-length Calopa protein, which is 655 amino acids, while the Calopa maternal encodes a truncated protein variant that only has 635 amino acids, lacking the N-terminal 20 amino acids of Calopa. And uh, they're going to show you uh, figure one, and here's the, the maternal one, interestingly, starts first and then drops a bunch, and then after that is exactly the same as uh, the other Calopa. Whereas the zygote starts in front and starts transcribing, apparently this gap is enough to leave fewer uh, uh, fewer amino acids in the transcription. There's about 20 amino acids different. So the maternal starts here, the zygote starts there, and then they continue on the same way eventually. And here you can see where Calopa is found in the head, if it's maternal. And then the later on, Calopa zygote is found here and makes that segmented area. And we'll hopefully show you uh, some uh, where it, uh, what happens when that, when that takes place. To confirm the alternative Calopa, maternal Calopa zygote transcripts and their non-overlapping expression patterns, we performed whole mount RNA in situ hybridization experiments with transcript-specific probes. The Calopa maternal transcript was anteriorly localized, as we saw in pre-blastoderm embryos, but absent at the cellular blastoderm stage. Conversely, the Calopa zygote transcript was absent in pre-blastoderm emb embryos, but expressed broadly in the trunk region of seven-hour-old blastoderm embryos, like odd-paired in Drosophila. Since it's cal odd-paired, well, it's not surprising. These observations suggest that Calopa produces transcripts isoforms with spatially and temporally distinct expression patterns. There's one and there's the other, and they don't, they're not just kind of blurred together. To determine the function of Calopa maternal and Calopa zygote, we established a protocol for microinjecting early Clogmia embryos and conducted transcript specific RNA interference experiments. They're going to put an RNA that's going to interfere with producing the protein. Injection of Calopa maternal double stranded RNA. Uh, the other strand, I think, is what they're saying, led to mirror image duplications of the tail end. That is, if you get rid of that, you, do, you have two tail ends, you don't have a head. And there's, here's the wild type here. With the head, you can see is developing, and the tail that is also developing, and you can see the difference between the two. And here, this one has two heads. Now, we're going to see in a little bit that this, this one has a, does have a head and it does have a tail, but the body is kind of messed up. And it, here you can see where odd paired is doing its job and making segments. In contrast, injection of double-stranded RNA tiger, targeting Calopa zygote results in half the number of segmental expression domains of CAL-SLP, the ortholog of pair rule gene sloppy paired. They're invented with their names because they have to be. And cause defects in segmentation, dorsal closure, and head development. It looks horrible, but did not alter embryo polarity. There's still a head, there's still a tail. Finally, injection of double-stranded RNA targeting both Calopa maternal and Calopa zygote resulted in double abdomens with missing segments. So uh, both uh, defects are shown at the same time, and um, I, that's in the supplement material. These observations indicate distinct roles for Calopa maternal and Calopa zygote in specifying embryo polarity 
and then segmentation respectively. One does polarity, the other one does uh, segmentation. Again, there's the shortened one. They don't show here one with both, but you can imagine it. And the, here's a wild type with a lot of, uh, 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 and, and, the, and the, here's one if you, if you block the RNA, uh, you, get, you get a tail on both ends. We notice that maternal transcript of Cal SLP and Cal Mira, a homologue of Miranda, which encodes an adapter protein for sulfate determining determinants in Drosophila, were also slightly enriched in the anterior portion of the embryo. This observation was confirmed by RNA in situ hybridizations and uh, injection of Cal SLP double stranded RNA resulted in head and dorsal closure defects. Head don't form, doesn't form right, and neither does the back. But um, while Cal Mura uh, DS double stranded RNA caused labral and antennal defects, but in both cases, embryo polarity was retained. So you still had a head, it was just deformed. To test whether CalOPA maternal can induce head development ectopically, we injected CalOPA maternal mRNA into the posterior pole of one hour old embryos. So basically, they're trying to see if you put this stuff on, can you get a head on the other end? And in fact, uh, developed a symmetrical double head. So you can make it with two heads, including some duplicated thoracic elements. These observations suggest that anterior enrichment of maternal transcripts other than CalOPA maternal mRNA is not essential for head development and that CalOPA maternal localization is sufficient for establishing embryo polarity. And there's one where they've injected both and you can see uh, in the wild type uh, you actually, you can get two eyes out of it. Um, there and get, this is, this will come back to later on it has to do with putting different chemicals in and seeing whether you get uh, two abdomen uh, uh, mutants the anterior determinant function of calopa is sensitive to expression timing but insensitive to five prime truncation of the open reading frame Next, we ask whether the early timing of odd paired expression is critical for its function as anterior determinant in moth flies. So to test this hypothesis, we conducted posterior injection of CalOPA maternal. That is, remember, you can inject it early and you get two heads. Uh, during the syncytial blastoderm stage, you wait four hours instead of do it at uh, one half hour and examine Cal-OTD expression after gastrulation. These embryos develop with normal head to tail polarity. So if you wait long enough, they still have heads. Uh, you can only do that early on. This result places the requirement of odd paired for axis specification prior to the syncytial blastoderm stage. Got to do it early. And suggests that early timing of odd paired activity is essential for its function as an anterior determinant. Now you'll notice that at this point we're um, only dealing with uh, one particular fly. Now, here you'll notice that they've uh, used several different kinds of chemicals and this one, this one, and this one did not give you any double-tailed uh, double embryos, whereas these ones done the way they're listed, do. Calopa, maternal and calopa zygote mRNA not only differ in timing of expression, but also differ in their five prime UTRs and predicted N-terminal protein sequences, as mentioned above. And I'm gonna skip over some of this because otherwise we'll never get through within an hour. Calopa suppresses zygotic germ specification at the anterior pole and Clogmia lacks maternal germ plasm. They did tests to find out, well obviously it has some maternal germ plasm because it, it, but it doesn't have the markers that normally fit there. 
In Drosophila and other dipterans, maternal germplasm in the posterior embryo not only specifies primordial germ cells, but also contributes to and stabilizes embryo polarity via another gene called nanos, which suppresses the translation of anterior determinants in the posterior embryo. Evolution of the anterior determinant function of the moth fly odd paired. This is how it works. Maternal odd paired transcript is absence in freshly deposited eggs of chernomids and mosquitoes, both of which belong to the Kulikomorpha lineage. To test whether odd, a localized maternal odd pair transcripts is broadly conserved in the Psychodomorpha lineage, we examined maternal transcript localization in the eggs of the flan, sand fly, which is another one of those Psychodomorphas, um, Lutsumia longipalpis, a moth spy, fly species of public health concern. Some of this stuff they're interested because in this particular case, it's uh, used uh, to transmit uh, visceral leishmaniasis. Of 5,392 annotated transcripts, the most enriched maternal transcript in the anterior half of one to two hour old embryos was homologous to odd paired and was therefore named Alalo Opa, maternal. In the posterior Lutzmia embryo, the most enriched transcript was homologous to Oscar indicating the Lutzmamia eggs do contain maternal germplasm at the posterior pole, unlike the Clogmia eggs. So Clogmia has lost maternal germplasm, or at least has lost some markers of maternal germplasm. These findings suggest that a broad range of moth flies use odd paired transcripts as anterior determinant, and that maternal germplasm was lost only in the Clogmia lineage. Close examine of Lutzmia transcriptomes, and, uh, that should not be uh, italicized, from one hour uh, old and 24 hour old embryos also revealed zygotic odd paired transcript. That is, and that should be odd paired, should be italicized, LLO Zopa zygote. Close examination of Lutzmia transcripts from one hour and 24 hour old embryos also revealed zygotic odd paired transcript. So you can see it in both uh, maternal and zygotic. Uh, Elolopa maternal and zygotic share the same open reading frame, so they produce the same protein, but differ at their untranslated five prime and three prime ends. Since the end terminal ends of Elopa uh, and Elopa zygote and Calopa zygote pro, uh, Proteins are homologous. Apparently, the 20 chopped out from maternal, from calopa, is not um, uh, analogous. We infer that the end termination truncation of calopa maternal occurred after the transcript had evolved maternal expression and anterior localization. I mean, must have, because it's easier to explain you know, unless you go to design, which of course we're not going there. Uh, the detection of uh, Elalopa maternal transcript in 24-hour embryos con coincided with uh, that of gap and perule segmentation gene homologs, indicating that Elalopa zygote functions during segmentation, just like Calopa. The odd pair gene of ancestral moth flies could have evolved the ability to establish the embryo polarity via specific amino acid substitutions. That's one theory. In this case, odd paired homologs from species with a different anterior determinant, such as Drosophila or Chernomus, should not induce ectopic head development in Clogmia embryos. Alternatively, odd paired could have evolved its role as axis determinant in moth flies independently of any amino acid substitution, <coughs> excuse me, via co-option. In this case, odd paired homologs from Dros Drosophila or Chernomus should uh, could have the ability to induce head development in Clogmia embryos when appropriately expressed. So let's inject um, stuff from Z Drosophila or Chernomus and see if we get uh, 
the result, uh, which result we get. To test this possibility, we injected odd paired mRNA from Lutzomia chironomus or Drosophila into the posterior pole of the early Clogmia embryos. All of those odd paired homologs induce double heads. Doesn't matter which one you use. Pro provided that the endogenous uh, COSEX sequence of Cal OPA maternal was used for optimum translation efficiency. Since neither Drosophila or, nor Chironomus uses odd paired for specifying embryo polarity, these results suggest that amino acid substitutions were not essential for the evolution of the anterior determinant function of odd paired in moth flies. We therefore propose that this gene function evolve via co-option when alternative maternal transcript of moth fly odd paired became enriched at the anterior pole. Got it? A previously uncharacterized C82H2 zinc finger gene named Cucoid functions as the anterior determinant in Kilocene mosquitoes. We had a protein. We had no clue what it did. Now we know what it does, and it, you, it's used to make heads in Kilocene mosquitoes. Given that freshly deposited mosquito eggs lacked maternal odd pair transcript orthologs, we extended our search for anterior determinants to mosquitoes. So we're going to uh, do a lot of these. Initially, we found on the southern house mosquito, Culex quinquefasciatus, a vector of West Nile virus, the leading cause of mosquito-borne disease in the continental United States, and of Wuchereria bancrofti, the major cause of lymphatic filariasis in other countries. This species was chosen because their, legs, their eggs are large and have clearly distinguishable anterior and posterior egg poles. So you can tell which end is supposed to be which by morphology. We obtained similar results in another Kilocene mosquito, the yellow fever mosquito, Aedes aegypti, which transmits, besides yellow fever, uh, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika viruses. In this species, expression profiling of 5802 transcripts from the anterior and posterior transcriptomes of one hour pre-blastoderm embryos, that's cutting them in half, remember, um, also identified cucoid as the gene with the most significantly enriched transcript in the anterior embryo. So cucoid is used here. In the posterior embryo, I'm sorry, um, no highly enriched transcripts were observed. This was unexpected. This whole paper is unexpected. Pangolin TCF functions as anterior determinant in anopheline mosquitoes. So remember the Culex mosquitoes, uh, it's cucoid. In Anopheles gambia species complex constitutes an outgroup to the Culex aedes clade and just to skip over all of the uh, stuff that they publish, it's pangolin in Anopheles mosquitoes which is different from cucoid, which cucoid is a brand newly discovered protein. Localization of maternal pangolin transcript in crane flies suggests that pangolin functioned as anterior determinant in ancestral flies because pangolin is, is with Anopheles mosquitoes and also in crane flies. Anterior localized maternal pangolin transcript has been observed in the eggs of a beetle so pangolin apparently is several different organisms, include stuff that's completely different. But the function of this transcript remains unknown. Previous TCPAN RNA I experiments targeted both maternal and zygotic transcripts and only revealed a function in posterior development due to the role of zygotic TCPAN in canonical WNT signaling in posterior growth zone. Remember, the other ones tell you where the head's going to be this one apparently tells you where the tail was going to be. Pangolin cannot substitute for Panish in Chironomus. In the mid Chironomus, the ortholog of Pangolin, Crypan, is not expressed maternally, but its divergent, uh, diverged pa uh, paralog Panish functions maternally as an anterior determinant. 
given that Panish evolved from Pangolin via gene duplication, Panish probably inherited his role from Pangolin. Remember, Pan Panish and Pangolin have this 30 amino acid overlap, and the rest of them are different. Discussion. Role of alternative transcription in the evolution of embryonic axis determination, determinants from old genes. In this study, we have identified three unrelated old genes that encode the anterior determinant in moth flies, chelicine mosquitoes, and anopheline mosquitoes, respectively. All three genes not only localize their maternal transcript at the anterior egg pole, they are also subject to alternative transcription, which allows a single gene to generate multiple transcript isoforms with distinct five prime and three prime ends in the mRNA through the use of alternative promoters and polyadenylation signals, the head and the tail. In addition to changes in UTR sequences, alternative transcripts can also result in the truncation or an elongation of the open reading frame. In the truncation in the maternal odd paired protein that we observed in Clogmia is not conserved in Litzmaia, in which um, LLO OPA and LLO uh, is maternal and zygotic encode the same protein. And full length odd paired homologs from these and other species can function as anterior de determinants in Clogmia. Evolution of new genes that encode embryonic axis determinants. Unlike the anterior determinants identified in this study, the previously described anterior determinants of Drosophila and Charonimus are encoded by newly evolved genes by code and Panish. These genes seem to be dispensable outside the context of axis specification, suggesting that they evolved specifically for this function, or were designed for this function. We therefore propose that Panish, which evolved from pangolin via gene duplication in the Charonomy lineage, inherited his function from pangolin. Further examinations of pangolin isoforms and their expressions in the eggs of Charonomids that lack Panish orthologs, species that representing basal Charonomid lineages, could reveal intermediate steps in this process, such as a localized truncated pangolin isoform. They don't yet. That's for more research to find out. You think you can use evolution to predict that? Well, we'll find out. Similarly, bicoid could have acquired its function de novo via protein evolution or via inheritance from its progenitor gene, Zirknalt. We cannot rule out that orthodentical functioned as an anterior determinant in the ancestral brachycerian flies. However, in analogy with our findings, it is also possible that a maternal Zirknalt isoform became localized at the anterior pole of the egg and acquired the, the role of anterior determinant via co-option prior to the origin of bicoid via gene d duplication. It may be objected that in Drosophila, reverting the K50 residue of the bicoid homeo domain to Q50, that is making a mutation from K to Q, K is uh, arginine, no, R is arginine, K is lysine, I think. Uh, and turning it into Q is glutamine, I believe. Anyway, to changing one residue is lethal and results in a bicoid null phenotype. In other words, you kill the embryo. However, how the ancestral gene work, uh, network responded to the K50, uh, Q50K mutation of bicoid cannot be inferred from observations in Drosophila. Moreover, published biochemical data suggesting that the K Q, uh, Q50K mutation increases interaction with the consensus of bicoid binding DNA motif mo much stronger than it reduces interaction with the consensus Zirknalt binding DNA motif. Role of alternative transcription in the evolution. And it just says in the evolution. In the evolution of what? I'm not sure. Uh, recent genome-wide analyses have shown that alternative transcription is a widespread phenomenon. For example, there are on average four alternative transcription sites, sites per gene in humans. 
and at least 50 to 70 percent of mammalian genes are subject to alternative polyadenylation. So this phenomenon is around in a lot of different animals. However, the contribution of alternative promoters, alternative transcription initiation, and polyadenylation signals, uh, alternative transcription termination, to the evolution of new gene functions and regulatory networks remains poorly understood. It takes, what, five references to say that? Our in vivo study re revealed three old genes that evolved the anterior determinant function by localizing an alternative transcript isoform at the anterior pole of the egg. Therefore, we propose that differential expression of alternative transcript isoforms can result in the evolution of new gene functions independent of and prior to gene duplication and subfunctionalization. Given that alternative transcription is a widespread phenomenon, it could play an important role in the evolution of gene regulatory networks. And with that, we finish. Well, except for the comments of Cornelius Hunter, which I think are apropos. Again, on the internet, unexpected, but why? As the paper in the journal eLife admits, this diversity of anterior determinants was unexpected. What the authors do not explain is why these findings are unexpected. Understanding this is crucial in order to appreciate fully the research. When evolutionists refer to results as unexpected, they don't usually elaborate because what they mean is that results are unexpected according to their theory. In other words, the theory of evolution does not predict such findings. This case is no different. In fact, evolution predicts the exact opposite. In different species, especially in closely related species, fundamental molecular machinery should be homologous. That is, similar genes and similar processes should drive fundamental processes. And head to tail is a fundamental process. Indeed, evolutionists have often celebrated this sort of finding. Consider how Christian de Duve exalts the supposed success of evolutionary theory on the first page of his book, Vital Dust. All extant li living organisms, this is um, uh, Hunter's emphasis, are constructed of the same materials. Um, I have omitted some of the quote. Function according to the same principles, and indeed are actually related. All are descendants of a single ancestral form of life. This fact is now established thanks to the comparative sequences of proteins and nucleic acids. You're going, wait a minute, that's not what we just saw. And there's another guy that says the same thing. Um, famous guy too, and I've forgotten wh who he quoted now, but um, just one difficulty. There's only one problem. This is now known to be all false. And animal egg anterior determinants are yet another example of this monumental failure of evolutionary theory. Evolution predicts the exact opposite. The genetics and molecular mechanisms involved in animal egg orientation should reveal a grand pattern of similarity across distance, uh, different species, especially closely related ones. That is, you should have what is known as a nested hierarchy. Evolutionists cannot have it both ways. They cannot prove their theory when the findings work for them and softly walk away when the findings do not work. If evidence X is powerful proof text of evolution, then evidence not X is a monumental falsification. Skipping the last two paragraphs, I think Cornelius Hunter is right. If the sequence of cytochrome C is a powerful evidence for, of evolution, and it was claimed that way uh, since back when I was in school, then the use of entirely different molecules for determining where the head of a dipteroid will develop in closely related groups is a powerful evidence that unguided evolution uh, did not happen. Now one can try to explain away those differences. Of course, when you do, you, you reduce the predictive power of the theory. One cannot then use the similarities as a powerful argument, maybe a minor argument for unguided evolution. Frankly, I think the disproofs are, in fact, more powerful than the proofs, as it is difficult to understand how a dipteroid can stay alive while switching head markers, and, of course, dead intermediates cannot evolve. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. Well, I'll just... Uh so you kind of referred that in your last sentence here. Uh, what goes on here when you're switching, uh, at least these, uh, these molecules are very different. 
when you're switching from one to the other through a process of gradual natural selection? Well, it seems like when you have to have a molecule that's going to do the job, and then you have to have a receptor or a responder afterwards yes, that I responds mean. to that particular molecule. And if you're going to switch the molecule, then you have to switch the receptor at the same time. If you don't do that, you're toast. In the process of survival of the fittest, why should this new system ever evolve since it involves several steps? Uh, and this has to be spread through the population. Uh, That's the old uh, argument for irreducible complexity. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a chicken and egg uh, issue again uh, to this, but uh, it, it's another case of this that you have, uh, I think. Why, why uh, uh, these different molecules, you don't expect them to... You might as well believe in miracles if you think all of a sudden a new molecule is going to show up here that works at a different part uh, with a different part and so on. I mean, it, uh, might as well believe in miracles. Yes. <clears throat> I... Uh was quite familiar with the basic uh, processes involved in establishing the anterior-posterior axis. And of course that, the, the grand dogma comes from Drosophila. The one thing that isn't clear to me in this is whether or not this is particularly noteworthy. Uh, what I got from, not being familiar with the literature, what I got from you is the use of a bunch of different names that ended up performing the same process. And those the, names the one thing for is, different The one proteins. thing wasn't clear is, is the name change the result of a slight variant in sequence? I mean, well, the... This gets, this gets started with, while well, each of these uh, mRNAs that establish axis are anchored by their untranslated region, 5' UTR, at either an anterior or posterior site in the egg, which of course the, is maternally determined. Now to get something else in the same position, you either have the female changing the characteristics of the UTR, or the different names are very, very similar molecules. So are we looking at small variations on a theme? Um, uh, using just the names doesn't tell you whether well, it's like this uh, yeah. or like that. Well, if you read the article carefully, pangolin apparently is pretty much the same all the way across the species and is used for other things besides just head determination. Yeah. Well, in this case, bicoid is the well-known. But bicoid is brand new and is only used, as far as we can tell, in Drosophila to tell you that the head goes here. Okay, so that's a perspective, of course, I didn't have. Uh, and bicoid is, as far as I can read, not particularly similar to pangolin at all. Well, that was my question. Yeah. Because the rest of the machinery is turned on by products that are activated by the bicoid uh, mRNA and proteins. And that, Anopheles mosquitoes have a whole new zinc finger thing that has no obvious relationship. Uh, maybe, maybe there's a 20 or 30 percent uh, similarity in the uh, amino acid, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not a closely related uh, article, uh, protein at all, you know. Yeah, well, and, none. and then, so, so, I mean, you have to change, well, let's say it's, let's say it's 30 percent. That means you have to change 70 percent of the protein in order to make it work. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, it depends on how closely you need it to be related, but that's not, that's not one of those statistically obvious things. Uh, I, no, I shouldn't say statistically obvious things. Uh, I should say, well, statistics in one sense, 
I suppose 30% uh, is rather remarkable over a large uh, protein, but it's certainly not, it's not ready made in the, you know, two tweaks and you're good. Yeah, one, one wonders where this potential variability, how it's stored and where it originated, uh, if in fact, as you're saying, uh, the bicoid and, and pangolin proteins are quite different from each other, yet accomplish the same function. You still well, have gap genes, parallel genes, etc., expressing sequentially, laying out the body plan. Yeah, well, even in pan pangolin and panish, which are, you know, obviously somewhat related to each other, there's 30 amino acids that are pretty much identical. I mean, I don't know, they don't say like 29 out of 30. I, let's give them give a benefit of the doubt and say it's 30 out of 30. Um, that, that, that particular domain is just frozen in time. And then the rest of it, uh, Panish apparently has a f front end or back end or both that are similar to other proteins entirely and look like they've you know, been cobbled together from those proteins. And somehow the organism has said, you know, we, we want a new head protein, so we'll just, we'll take this cobbled thing and toss the pangolin and use this instead. And the pangolin can be used for something else. Sounds to me like a very happy accident. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair statement. There's so many different ways of looking at this. That, uh, I mean, I understand the basics, but to try to interpret it in a meaningful way. If you have any gradual control. change, uh, how survival is, going, is not going to work as long as you have a system that are working there? Well, that, that's the thing. When you switch from one to the other to make your head, You have to have an intermediate generation or set of generations where somehow the head develops without anything. <laughs> Which doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, it sounds like a bunch of technical stuff, and it is, but it's exactly the kind of technical stuff that shouldn't happen with standard evolutionary theory. But to, to Why would it happen without evolutionary theory. Well, if you're a designer and you say, you know what, I'd like to use pangolin in a slightly different way, and so let's modify the pangolin and now we're gonna to wanna to have panish instead. And so you make panish out of, you know, semi-new material and, and you just, and, and you can keep the organism alive while you're doing it because you designed, uh, you designed the genes to be there all at once. See. That's, certainly, this speaks to a reservoir of potential change that has to be there some way. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, is this a way of preparing organisms to meet challenges that have yet to develop? while keeping them as consistent as possible until the need to change? Well, the, qu the question is, um, if there's a designer, and let's say he's, a, he's smarter than we are, which is probably not unreasonable to assume, um, then uh, did, he, did he make mosquitoes from a crane fly model to begin with? Uh, are mosquitoes part of the curse? Or did he, were mosquitoes originally uh, designed uh, to function in Eden? I don't know. Were they originally designed to suck, suck plant juices? And, because um, I understand some do at this point, in which case, uh, you know, all the blood sucking and everything comes from another, uh, another source. Um, 
or certainly another time. So, if, uh, you know, if Adam and Eve are running around without any clothes on, it's a rather wide body area for mosquitoes to descend on if they're mosquitoes. Ooh. <laughs> you're, so you're saying disease-carrying organisms were part of the original creation? And they had uh, the viruses, et cetera, to create the disease? Well, maybe they were started well? out, I mean, as long as we're kind of sort of spitballing this, maybe they started out as plant-sucking stuff. Yes. And then they developed a taste for human blood at the point at which there was sin. Um, but, but the thing of it is, then you could have God designing Culex complex mosquitoes and Anopheles complex mosquitoes with different head uh, determinants in their eggs because they were designed that way. Yeah. And then, of course, in, mutations of some source afterwards, presumably after the onset of sin, would have, been, would have allowed things to change. Well, it seems like in that case you should ex at least expect rather consistent uh, amino acid sequence in the produced proteins from different sources. Only up to the family level, and after that you can design anything you like. Because you don't have to evolve uh, beyond the family in level. In which direction are you using after that? Well, going up. Uh, that uh, that it is not necessary to think that all flies descended from the same ancestor. Even with help, they may have been designed. Well, I'd like a fly that does this, and I'd like a fly that does this, and I'd like a fly that does this, and uh, you know. Um, uh, pangolin doesn't work that well for fruit flies, so let's use bicoid instead. And so we'll, we'll, we'll put bicoid there. And that way you can get rid of all the extra mangoes that, they, that the Adam and Eve and, and the animals didn't eat. It gives us a lot of room, doesn't it? It does. The, the thing of it is, I find that an easier hypothesis to deal with than the hypothesis that you have one original and then you change to another one and over here you change to another one and over here you change to another one. In the fundamental, uh, I mean, head to tail is pretty fundamental in terms of embryos. Anyway, come back next week. We'll have some fun. Uh, uh, Warren Johnson will be here. <laughs>